MashaAllah, alhamdulillah, we've entered into the 27th night of the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, there's a strong opinion, there's nothing definitive, but according to our ulama, the strongest opinion is that tonight is Laylatul Qadr, which is the night of power. There's different ways of translating Laylatul Qadr. The night of power is one way of translating, like Qudra, the night of constriction, uh, because the ulama say that on this night, well, the Quran says that the angels descend, and the ruh, and the ruh, or the spirit, according to the mufassirin of the Quran, is the archangel Gabriel, Jibreel alayhi salam. The angels descend, and there's a type of constriction. So there's a type of uh, constriction on the earth due to the just a sheer amount of angels on the earth. Another meaning of Laylatul Qadr is the night of destiny, which Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, decrees um, for all of us what's going to happen during the year. And that is not to say that we are strict determinists. Imam Ali said, "Karamallahu Wajha," that du'a changes the Qadr. Now in reality, nothing can change the Qadr. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is perfect. But from our perspective, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us limited volition, something of free will, a limited ikhtiar. We have no power whatsoever to do anything intrinsically. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is neither strength nor power except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're given choice. We know this intuitively. You know, this is why we have courts of justice in the world. You know, someone who's caught, you know, or convicted of murder, you know, they're going to say, well, why are, you, why are you putting me in jail? This is part of the qadr. That's true. But we know intuitively that we have limited volition. We know this. It's part of our nature. So when we act, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the occasion of our action, He dispenses His qudra, He dispenses His power. Another meaning of Laylatul Qadr is the night of uh, honor or rank, because Qadr in Arabic also means to have rank. So this is a truly momentous occasion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to come and gather. The Prophet وسلم, he said in a hadith which is sound, Man qama laylatul qadri imanan wahtisaban. Whoever stands to pray on laylatul qadr with faith, which is maybe a better translation as confidence than faith. I don't have a problem with faith, but some people, they hear the word faith and they think, oh, that's the opposite of reason. You're either logical and have reason or you have faith. Right? And this is something that the new atheists have really started in the West right after 9-11, that faith is this type of uh, blind adherence to believe without reason. So to have confidence in something is a better word. And confidence just means faith. Con fides, with faith. It doesn't carry the baggage of the word. Unfortunately, the word faith is being, it's been sullied. So we should try to own it to redefine it or use a different word. But we believe because it is reasonable to believe. That's why we believe. You know? Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said to his people, um, uh, he said, do you not see what you worship? Uh, you and your fathers of old? In Fakhr al Razi, he said about this ayah, this is in Surat Shu'ara, I believe. He said that in this ayah, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he wants them to think about what they're worshipping. This is a verse, he says, this is a verse that condemns this type of theological taqlid. This type of blind adherence in matters of theology. It's not permissible. 
to be a blind follower in matters of theology. In other words, you have to believe what you believe. You have to be able to explain why you believe something. That's called discursive theology. You don't have to be a theologian, but you have to know something. If somebody asks you, you know, why do you believe in Islam? Your answer shouldn't be, I was, my dad's Muslim. Or my grandfather's Muslim. Or, you know, I just raised in a Muslim household. You should be able to give reasons. Why do you believe the Quran is the word of God? Why do you believe the Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God? And one of the keys of getting these types of understandings, these types of openings and understandings, because, yeah, there's, there, I mean, there's IQ, right? I think IQ is real. Some people say it's not real. I don't know why they say that, but... Yeah, your intelligence is probably to a certain degree determined by genetics. But we also believe in futuhat, in openings, right? And I've seen this with... with I've seen people that struggle with, like, learning Arabic like really struggle, and then I see them a short time later, and they're, mashallah, fluent in Arabic. How did this happen? Well, dua is mukhul ibadah, and sometimes we forget that, right? This is the essence, dua, supplication, calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the essence of worship, right? We call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from, from the depths of our hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers our dua. In some way or another, he's going to answer our dua. Whether in this world or in the next world. But this has, this has a, a type of efficacy to it. Don't think dua is falling on deaf ears. A'udhu billah. Call on Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and your Lord says, call upon me and I shall answer you. So whoever stands Laytul Qadr imanan with confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wahtisaban, and expecting a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, where are the two na'alain, where are the two sandals of hope and fear? Right? Of khawf and raja. Right? So we have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have hope he's going to forgive us. And we have fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have so much fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we start to despair of the mercy of Allah. And it's haram to be in a state of mercy. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not be in a state of mercy. Do not be in a state of despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on the other side, on the other hand, we don't have so much hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we start becoming a bit lazy. Right? And by lazy, I mean sloth. This is one of the seven deadly sins according to the Catholic tradition. So sloth is spiritual laziness. Not in dunya. There's people that are lazy in dunya, yeah, but this is not what we're talking about. You can work 80 hours a week and have sloth. 80 hours a week in the dunya and still be spiritually lazy. Right? Um, so, don't have so much hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you start leaving the prayer. That you start uh, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a haq upon us to obey him. And one of the companions of the Prophet Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he came to the Prophet for advice. And he's related, he's the cousin of the Prophet And the Prophet said, Ihfadillah yahfidhik. That, that literally guard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will guard you. Preserve Allah, he will preserve you. Say, preserve Allah. Guard Allah. What is the meaning of this? According to the uh, ulama, the meaning of this is guard the commandments and prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will prioritize you. He'll give you tawfiq. 
If we prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will prioritize us. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, in tansurullaha yansurkum, or yuthabbit aqdamakum. O you who believe, give victory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give victory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so that He might give victory to you. And He'll plant your feet firmly. How do we give victory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? According to the exegetes, we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the means of our obedience is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is clear from the Quran. We follow Allah and His Messenger. Qul. إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتِّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ الله غفور الرحيم. This ayah in the Quran is chapter 3, verse 31. This is called Ayatul Imtihan, the verse of examination. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu Say, if you really love Allah, then follow me. Follow the Prophet sallallahu Then he will love you and forgive you your sins. Allah is forgiving and merciful. So adherence to Allah and His Messenger. This is of paramount importance. And life is short, you know, very short. I remember Y2K. Many of you were born after Y2K. <laughs> I remember my first day of kindergarten. I ran away. Our house was across the street. I remember walking across the street and looking at my shadow on the street. I can still remember this. This was in, you know, 2017 dollars. This was in the 80s. I'm dating myself. I'm actually younger than I looked. Though. That's what people tell me. <laughs> but time goes quickly. And I, as I always tell our young people, life is too short to sell out the dean. Right? It's going to be over soon. I know that sounds a bit maybe morbid, but it's true. And we need some, we need, uh, some reminders you know, that are sort of uh, sober. We need sober reminders. Life is short. Life moves quickly. Right? Have istiqamah in the religion. You know. So, nowadays especially, there's all this madness happening. There's, it's, it's very difficult for a lot of people. And the Prophet Sallallahu said them, he said, there's going to be a time when someone who has patience over his religion is like clutching onto a cinder, a burning coal. You know, imagine holding a burning coal. That's that's how hard it's going to be, holding on to your deen. So you have to keep juggling it. Some people drop it. Some people get burned. But we have to hold on to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, hold tightly to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't be divided. Right? Wa'atisim, means a type of grip that's going to save your life. Like the, the ulama say, I'atisam is the grip. Imagine the grip. Imagine you fall into the ocean and someone throws you a lifeline. Imagine your grip on that rope. That's called al I'atisam. Hold on for your life. The Prophet wasallam said, Alaykum bi-sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafai al-rashidin al-mahdiyin. تَمَسَّكُوا بِهَا وَعَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ The imagery he's using to communicate this truth. He says, I exhort you to follow my sunnah in the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs. The rightly guided caliphs, Abu Bakr Siddiq, رضي الله عنه, Umar ibn al-Khattab, رضي الله عنه, Uthman ibn Affan, رضي الله عنه, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, رضي الله عنه, Imam Hassan, عليه السلام, رضي الله عنه. These are the five, according to Imam Suyuti, the five rightly guided caliphs. Hold on to their sunnah. Hold fast to it and bite down on it with your molar teeth. This is what he says. These molar teeth are very strong. Bite down on it as if your life depended on it. Don't let go of it. Because life is short. You know? And don't, don't join a firqa. means don't join a firqa. A firqa is a group that believes they have the exclusive truth and everyone else is a kafir amongst the Muslims. This is different than a madhab. It's permissible to join a madhab, even recommended. A madhab is a school of thought, like a university. Right? The first firqa in our history were the khawarij, the karajites, as they're called. They believed they had the truth. Everyone else was a kafir. They make takfir of even sahaba. 
They, they don't discriminate. If you can say one thing positive about them, <laughs> they don't discriminate. They don't care if you're Fulan or Imam Ali. They make takfir of you. But that's a firqa. And the Prophet وسلم, he warned us against those types of people. And the Prophet وسلم, was one who united the hearts. Right? And his disposition was very gentle. Which is amazing because he came into an environment that was extremely harsh. And the fact that he had this gentle disposition is a, is a miracle. I mean, his life is a miracle if, if people would just open their eyes. I mean, he, he's, he's the most praised human being in the history of the world. His name means the praised one. Right there, it's like, okay. How, how do people not see this? His name, Muhammad, وسلم, means the one who is often praised. But now you have like Christian apologists saying, that's, that's his later name. That's not his real name. Can't be his real name because that's such an obvious sign that he was a prophet. So no, his 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 actual name was Al Amin. They say that's his real name. You know, completely uh, misreading. No, that was his title that was given to him. But you see the trickery that they use, right? A Sadiq Al Amin was a title that was given to him by the Quraysh before Islam, right? Because even they testified to his his truthfulness. So the Prophet وسلم, he unites the hearts. And this is mentioned in the Quran. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَلَهُمْ فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَلَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ It is part of the great mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have lean, you gentle disposition. If you were harsh or hard-hearted, you would have seen men flee from your presence. He was a gentleman. This is a beautiful word in English. The Prophet Sallallahu was a gentleman, a true man, right? And part and parcel of being a gentleman is sometimes a gentleman has to have a bit of uh, strictness because he has to be courageous. He has to set the earth. He has to, um, he has to uh, place justice upon the earth. He has to defend uh, people under his uh, authority. And so we see that beautiful balance in the Prophet Sallallahu that no other Prophet had. He's insan al-kamil, right? As he's called by our ulama. Every Prophet is insan al-kamil, but no one had the perfect equilibrium like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, look at a Prophet, statesman, military genius, military leader, father, right? Uh, um, uh, messenger of God, etc., etc., etc. No one in history is like this. This is a major sign, a major dalil of our religion, a major dalil of his nubuwa, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So engaging in the Quran, engaging in the Quran is very important. Engaging with the Quran, afalaya tadabbaruna al Quran. Do they not penetrate the meanings of the Quran? What does the Quran say about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What does the Quran say about our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is the month of the Quran. So there's a few early surahs of the Quran that were revealed to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during a time of extreme difficulty in his life. Right? During a time when basically the Quraysh were trying to cancel him. Right? We live in a weird culture nowadays where people are offended very easily. People don't want to have discussions. People don't want to talk about anything. You know, it's strange. They won't even let you, talk. if you say, for example, you know, I don't really think it's a good idea to give children, you know, hormones when they're nine or 10 years old uh, and socialize them. They don't, want to, they don't want to hear it. They won't let you talk. They'll just cancel you. They'll kick you off social media. It's very strange. And the Prophet Sallallahu during the early period, there was, you know, there was distress. There was, it was a time of anxiety, even depression. So I want to talk about one surah in particular, and I mentioned this in the past, uh, but nowadays it's, it's even more relevant. Um, surah 93 of the Quran is called Surah Al-Duha. And this surah really gives us a prescription as to how to deal with um, 
basically the postmodern world that we're living in, where more and more we're seen as just very strange people, which is a good sign, by the way, because <laughs> the Prophet said, Inna dina bada gariban, kama bada fatuba lil ghuraba. He predicted this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This deen began strange. It was very strange for the Arabs. You know, there's one God. You can't drink alcohol. You know, no fornication. So, oh, what is this? Very strange. And then it became normative, right? Because when Islam spread around the world, it became the standard. And then he said, it's going to return to be strange again. It's very strange, right? I remember... What was it? The year 2000, I was at the copy machine. I used, to, I used to be an accountant, by the way, making copies. And uh, one of the other employees said, I heard you're getting married. And I said, yeah. She said, oh, how long have you known each other? I said, about two weeks. Said, what? That's so strange. It's okay. And they come by my cubicle. Are you coming to happy hour? No. Why not? Uh, you know, I, I don't drink alcohol. What? <laughs> what do you do for fun? I'll never forget it. What do you do for fun? We live for the weekend. And then every Friday, like clockwork, are you coming to happy hour? Same people. Are you coming to happy hour? No. Are you coming to happy hour? One of my, <laughs> I have a neighbor, mashallah, brother Muhammad, he said, he said that a, a good way to get out of that is just to say, I'm a recovering alcoholic. <laughs> never ask you again, because that's something to remember. Right? I'll never ask you again. But, you know, we, we're strange people. You know? We believe in traditional morality. We believe in the difference between men and women. You know? I had a... Um, one of my professors at an undergrad was a, a rabbi, and uh, and uh, I asked him about shaking hands with women because they don't—he's Orthodox. They don't shake hands with women, right? And vice versa. It's called shomer nagaya. It's a—it's a concept they have in their halakha, which is their sharia. Um, and he said, "I said, how do you how do you explain this to people?" And he said, "I just tell them I'm sexist." And I said, "Whoa, what?" He said, yeah, what's the definition of being a sexist? You treat men and women differently. In fact, we all do that. And wh what's wrong with that? That's a good thing. Obviously, the people who, we're not talking about mistreating people of the opposite gender. There's only two genders, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's intuitively obvious. This is the problem with modern education. You go to a modern university, you drop 100K on an education, and you come out thinking, there's 55 genders? That's called, that's called a robber, that's called grand larceny. They drain the common sense out of you. You were smarter going in than you came out. And now you're a lot poorer. SubhanAllah. Yeah, this is it's a attack against the natural inclinations anyway. Um, so, and then, <laughs> I said, okay. And then he said, I'm also discriminatory. I discriminate. I said, well, what? You're a sexist. <laughs> you just, he said, yes, I discriminate. I treat people differently. I don't treat my mother like I treat my sister. I said, oh. But the modern world wants to equalize everybody. And this looks good on paper. You know? And I don't mean any disrespect, but it's kind of like, you know, like Christianity sort of looks good on paper. You know, love. God is love. It's love, man. He died for your sins, man. Isn't that beautiful? But then you scratch the surface a little bit, it kind of falls apart. Right? The Prophet said, treat people according to their status, according to their rank. Right? This is extremely important that we have a concept of hierarchy. The word hierarchy comes from the Greek. It means sacred rule. Hierarchy is established by God. The ultimate hierarchy at the top of the ultimate hierarchy is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If everyone's just equalized suddenly, say we're all equal, it sounds good, we're all equal. We're all equal. 
then what happens? The people of knowledge are completely decentralized. My opinion is good as their opinion. My opinion is, I can make tafsir of the Quran. Who cares? If you have 40 years of training. Blah. I have a translation here. I can read. I can take ahkam from the Quran. I can interpret the Quran. Right? And tell it al-amatu rabbataha. The Prophet sallallahu said, it's very interesting he chose this in the hadith Jibreel. When Jibreel alayhi salam, how many questions did Jibreel alayhi salam ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, by the way? Hurry, hurry. Hurry. Five. <laughs> Some people, most people say three. It's actually five, because we, we put the hadith on pause. Tell me about Ima Islam, tell me about Iman, tell me about Ihsan, then we push pause. Tell me about Sa'a, the hour. The one being questioned knows no more than the questioner. Yes, They ask you about the sa'a, say the, the knowledge of it is only with my Lord. Then tell me about its signs. That's the fifth question. Tell me about the signs of the sa'a. And the Prophet وسلم, could have said anything here. And tell me about the signs of the sa'a. Uh, a slave girl will, gi will give birth to her mistress. A slave girl will give birth to her master. Very interesting. There's different ways of looking at this hadith because the Prophet وسلم, had Jawami al Hikam, Jawami al Kalim, and Jawahid al Hikam. He had extremely comprehensive speech that's just saturated with sapience, with wisdom. So there's different ways of looking at this hadith. One way, according to modern scholars, traditional ulama that are in the modern world, is there's going to be a total leveling of society, that societal structures and hierarchies will be turned upside down. And we see that now. We see it everywhere, and it's not a good sign. People not respecting scholarship. They're not respecting age. He's not from us who doesn't have mercy on our little ones, our young ones, and have waqar uh, uh, and have respect for our older ones. Now you go into a university classroom and you know they're re referring to the hey, referring to the professor by his first name and you know openly disagreeing with bad adab you know one of the um one of my teachers said recently that one of the zaytuna alumnus he's at uh, georgetown and all these non-muslim professors are <laughs> they love him he's a graduate student because he shows so much respect to them he said this is this is amazing this is a very counterculture nowadays is just to show respect to a teacher is very strange, you know. So this religion will return as something strange. So during this time, the Prophet Sallallahu he received the, the wahi, iqra on Laylatul Qadr, and this is when the entire Quran was brought down. It's called an inzal. Inzal means the entire Quran was brought down to the Sama'ud Dunya. And then five verses from the Inzal were given to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's called the Tanzil or a piecemeal revelation. So Iqra, and then you have uh, Al-Mudathir and other early verses of the Quran. And then some of the Mushrikeen, they had caught wind that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was claiming to receive wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there was a break in the revelation. It's called the fatra. There was a break. And some say it was a few days, some say a few months. Even some of the Mufassirin say might have been up to a year, but there's a break. And so the Mushrikeen began to taunt and mock and ridicule the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And Umm Jumil bin Tuharb, who was the wife of Abu Lahab, who was canceled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the way. That's a cancellation you don't want. That's the cancellation we should be really concerned with. Because nobody's going to remember us in a hundred years. Everyone in this room in a hundred years unless, you know. I mean, they're trying to upload their consciousness into clouds now. That's what people are trying to do. 
There are people who think whatever's latest is greatest. This is their whole ph philosophy of life. Whatever's happening now must be the best. So right now, what we need to do is we, you know, stop getting married, go live in a pod, go buy an electric car, start eating bugs, and worship technology, and go into the metaverse, and become an avatar, and then eventually upload your consciousness into the cloud, and then we can download it into a cybergenic, a, a, a cyborg, and you can live forever. Isn't that beautiful? This is what millions of people believe, because this is their philosophy. Whatever is latest is greatest. And they say things like, you know, three years ago, I was an idiot. I was, I was using, you know, the wrong verbiage. But now, I'm woke. And um, I'm so different from three years ago. And then we say, okay, what about you, Mr. Muslim? The best generation is my generation. When was that? 1,400 years ago. Oh, my God. 1,400 years ago? You're a caveman? That's crazy. That's, what? How can this be? So, you know, this, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, one of the mushrikeen, she caught wind of that the Prophet Sallam was claiming uh, prophecy, and, there, and then there was a break in the river. So she said, to, she said, inna rabbahu wa da'ahu wa qalahu. Indeed, Oh yeah, Abu Lahab. That's the wife of Abu Lahab. That's what I'm talking about. Tabad yada Abi Lahabin watab. This watab means he's canceled. Goodbye. Abu Lahab is canceled. There's only a few people, by the way, we can say are canceled. We have to have a clear yani dalil. Abu Lahab is canceled. Abu Jahal is canceled. Fir'aun is canceled. Right? There's only a few people, so we have to be careful about consigning people to the hellfire. This is haram to do this in our religion. We can't do this. You know, the Christians, when they debate with us, I've been debating Christians for too long. That's why I look older than I really am. <laughs> Turn your hair gray. But uh, one of the sort of sales, one of the, I don't know what to call it, sales pitch, I don't know. They'll say something like, I have, I have a personal guarantee I'm going to paradise. A personal guarantee. Do you have this guarantee, Mr. Muslim? So it's not a personal guarantee. I mean, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Man qala la ilaha illa man, man shahida, man, man qala la ilaha illa Allah bi sidqin dakhala al janna." Whoever says la ilaha illa Allah with with uh, with uh, sincerity will enter paradise. But it's not a personal guarantee. You know, the Prophet said he didn't say, you know, that that Ali from California is going to dakhala al janna. But the Mus I hope to be that. He said that's not good enough. I have a personal guarantee. You know. And it's interesting, a lot of these Christians who claim to have these personal guarantees, they convert to Islam. What happened to your personal guarantee? So you can say, that, you're, you're, you, this, this Christian over here who was, who was like you, a Christian, does he still have a personal guarantee now that he's Muslim? No, 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 no. So what's the point of saying you have a personal guarantee? Anyway. So, inna rabbahu wa da'ahu wa qalahu. Indeed, his Lord has forsaken him and hates him. This is what she was going around saying. Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this beautiful surah, surah al duha as a surah of tasliya, of consolation. Consolation upon the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. wa idha saja. So he begins the surah by taking an oath. This is called a qasam, an adjuration. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by something, that something is great. And Allah says in the Quran, La amruka, by your life. He swears by the life of the Prophet. ﷺ. But in this case, what duha? What is what duha? This is the morning light. This is the light before the sun reaches its zenith. So that light is always soothing. It's not hot. It's not uncomfortable. Right? Even the, in the hottest of environments, the, the light of the duha is soothing. So the ulama say, duha here symbolizes the wahi, the revelation. Because this is a, a source of consolation and comfort for the Prophet ﷺ. So, by the revelation, saja, and by the night when it is still. So the opposite of duha is layl. So the opposite of revelation is when there's no revelation. All right? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, whether you're receiving revelation or not receiving revelation, Ma wa rabuka wa ma qala. 
your Lord has not forsaken you. Allah is saying, I swear your Lord has not forsaken you, nor is he displeased with you, nor does he hate you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forsake the Prophet sallallahu alayhi So what do we gain from this? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's revealing the surah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi but we are the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And in the Quran, you'll notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seamlessly moves from a second masculine singular to a second masculine plural. Speaking directly, in other words, speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and then speaking directly to him and his ummah without skipping a beat. Right? al-Masjid al-Haram. al-Masjid al-Haram. وَحَيْثُمَا كُنْتُمْ تَوَلُّوا وَجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَ وَجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَ Without skipping a piece, iltifat. This is in rhetoric, iltifat. Sudden change. Turn your face towards the sacred mosque. In the singular to the Prophet ﷺ. Wherever you are, turn your faces to the sacred mosque. What does this show, according to the Mufassireen, a very close intimate relationship between the Messenger of Allah ﷺ and, the Prophet, and, and his ummah. That's us. So this surah, Allah is speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu by, but by extension to the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu That if we obey Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in His Messenger, Allah will not forsake us, nor does He hate us. And this dunya is just, it's a test. It's a trial. And we should recognize it as being a test. And ashadda bala'an al-anbiya, the Prophet ﷺ said, the most severe of tribulations come to the prophets. Right? But it's never a punishment for them. It's a means by which Allah raises their rank. But for us, it could be that, but it, or, or else it could be a punishment. So we make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it's a punishment, then good. We make tawbah. Allah is purifying us in this world. And inshallah will put us into Jannah. We don't want the punishment in the next world. In Ibn Abbas, he says that if a bala, if a type of uh, trial comes to you, then make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it could have been worse, he says. Like, you know, you, you lose a million dollars, you could have lost two million dollars. You know, you, uh, you lost you, the use of one of your hands, you could have lost both of your hands. Make shukr, it could have been worse, number one. Number two, it only happened in the dunya not in the Akhirah. Number three, it didn't have anything to do with your deen, but in only in your dunya. So we should be in a state of shukr. So your Lord has not forsaken you, nor is he displeased with you. What is later is better than what is now. Right? So you can take this in two ways, that what is later in Medina is better than what's happening now in Mecca. In other words, have hope, be an optimist for your life now, right? Have hope that your life, your conditions will improve, but you have to uh, take initiative, right? So the famous iconic statement, right? Tie your camel, then trust in Allah. The better one was outside, didn't tie his camel, the camel's running around like this. And the Prophet said, whose camel is this? He said, that's my camel. Tawakkalu ala Allah, I've trusted Allah. He said, I'aqilha, hobble her, tie her down, then trust in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have hope, we have raja in Allah. Raja is different than tamanna. There's two words, there's many words for hope in Arabic. But tamanna is sort of a hope without action. Right? The, the Quran says, am lil insani ma tamanna, will, will, will a human being have whatever he hopes for vainly without any action? Right, tamanna, right, sitting back, and, uh, you know, making dua, but not taking any, any steps towards that, towards that end. Right? Muslim is an active participle. The word Muslim is called an ism fa'il. Right? Muslim, not muslam, not passive. Muslim is someone who is fa'al, someone who is active, who is doing things. Right? Like it says in the Hadith Qudsi, 
that if my servant draws close unto me, the span of a shibr, a hand span, that I draw close unto him, the span of a dhira, which is a, a cubit. And if he draws near to me, the hands, if he draws near to me, a dhira, a cubit, I, I come to him a fathom, which is this, arm's length, a wingspan. And if he walks towards me, I run towards him in no anthropomorphic way. Now we have to take an initial step. Right? So we have raja in Allah. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا You have in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct. Whoever has raja, hope in Allah, hope with action, hope with action in Allah and in the last day, it makes frequent remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرُ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى Another meaning of this is, the afterlife is better than this world for you. Right? So, you know, we, we do our best in this world, but we don't put all of our, all of our, what is the expression? All of our eggs in the, <laughs> all of our eggs in, in the spirit of Easter, even though we don't believe in it, because he was never crucified. But, alayhi salam, we don't put all of our eggs in the basket of the dunya. A lot of people do that. People of the world, ahlul dunya, that are materialists, this is all they have. So they try to create this kind of jannah on earth by any means necessary. This is tried in the past, and it's led to massive death, M massacres, whole-scale massacre, genocide. It doesn't work. You'll never actualize true justice in this world. We have to do the best we can, but at the end of the day, true justice will manifest on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. By Allah Adil, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on that day, we don't want justice. You don't want justice. On, on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, nobody is going to be saying no justice, no peace. Nobody wants justice on Yom Al-Qiyamah. You want mercy on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. Mercy. So, this is part of our commitment as Muslims that we believe in we believe in the, the punishment in the grave, the questioning in the grave. We believe in uh, the Yom Al-Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment. We believe in the Sirat. We believe in Jannah and Nar. You know. But we have hope in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Wala sofa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. And then Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu and by extension to all of us. And soon your Lord will give you something. A'ta. A'ta means like a gift. He'll gift you something. Fatarda. And immediately you'll be pleased. So what is this thing? According to Imam Suyuti, when the Prophet ﷺ received this ayah, and by the way, this ayah was given to him, according to Suyuti in the Itqan, directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without the intermediation of Jibreel alayhi salam, is placed directly into the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's a few times, the few places in the Quran where this happens, like the end of Al Baqarah, Khawatim al Baqarah, which it contains our essential creed. So this surah or duha and the following surah, Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak, these were placed directly into the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wala fatarda, and soon your Lord will give you something. And immediately you'll be pleased. And according to Imam Suyuti, the Prophet said, Lan arda wa wahidun min ummati fin nar. I will never be pleased. Lan, never be pleased. While one person from my ummah is in the fire. So the ulama say, what is this thing that's going to give the Prophet rida immediately? Is that the entire ummah will enter Jannah eventually. Soon I will give you this. Your entire ummah is going to enter paradise. Fatarda. Now look at what happens here. Right? This is, again, he's, by extension, he's speaking to all of us. In times of depression, in times of anxiety, right? What does Allah say to the Prophet ﷺ? He starts to remind him of past blessings. Did he not find you an orphan and gave you shelter and give you shelter? Don't you remember that? Alam is a rhetorical question. In the Quran, when it says alam, it's a, it's a istifham taqriri. It's a rhetorical question. The point of this question is not to get you to say yes or no. It's simply to remind you. 
In other words, in other words, you were an orphan and he sheltered you. Like Alam Tarakefa Fa'ala Rabbuka bi ashabil fil. And this again, second masculine singular, speaking to the Prophet. Uh, don't did, didn't you see what your Lord did to the companions of the elephant? In other words, you should remember that event. Why did Allah do that? That was the year you were born. Allah saved Mecca for your sake. Right? Because that was the year you were born. And you were searching and he guided you. And dalan here does not mean he was like lost or disobedient or something. This is by all of the Mufassirin. Dalan has different meanings. One of the meanings of dalan is wandering or searching for something. Asking for something. Because the Prophet وسلم, he his bi'tha was on Laylatul Qadr, but he was a prophet when Adam was bayna al-ruh wal jasad. He was a prophet before Adam alayhi salam. And this, this is sound, this is sound aqidah. This isn't some goofy Sufism. These are sound hadith. He was a prophet before Adam. He has irhas. He has pre-prophetic miracles. Prophetic meaning pre-bi'tha. Pre-commissioning miracles. That uh, Bahira, the monk, he saw a cloud covering the caravan in Bostra. And he knows from his knowledge of Ahlul Kitab that a cloud signifies tawfiq. Because a cloud would follow around the Bani Israel in the Sinai, demonstrating God's tawfiq, that God was with them, protecting them, etc. So he invited all of these men into his cell, right? He said, have a meal inside my cell. He was a monk. He's surrounded by manuscripts. So he noticed that there was a 12-year-old, 10-year-old boy amongst them, and that a palm tree had bent its trunk to, to shade him. So he approached this boy and he said, I'm going to ask you a question in the name of Alat and Al-Uzza. And the Prophet وسلم, does not interrupt people unless it's absolutely necessary. And he said, no names are more detestable to me than Alat and Al-Uzza. So Bahira said, oh, okay, he's passed the first test. This is a muahid, and he's the greatest muahid, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's the greatest monotheist in the history of humanity, and no one can deny this. No one can deny this, and the Jews they they don't know what to do with him. He's an enigma for them, because that's their claim to fame is tawhid. That's what they say. We're chosen because God chose us. They say Hashem chose us. God chose us to to to, to give the light of el echad of Tawheed to the Goyim, to the nations. That was their whole job. But this one man does it better than all their prophets put together. All their prophets put together. He says, oh, what happened here? So some of them said, okay, he's a Nebi, but he's only for the non-Jews. So he's for 99.99% of humanity. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're almost there. You're getting closer. Because they're very reluctant. They're very reluctant to ascribe to him kithb. Right? They're very reluctant to do that because he's, he's, he's so extremely successful as a monotheist. How can we say he's making this up? Okay, he's, he's for the non-Jews. Right? Ajib. <clears throat> so... Uh, and you were weighed down with family responsibilities and we enriched you so to enrich someone spiritually as well as financially and all of the Mufassirin say the means of his enrichment was a Sayyida Khadija Al-Kubra who supported him with her wealth so we have three reminders of past, past blessings so when you feel depressed when you have anxiety, when the modern world is bewildering us, which happens more and more now. I can go into some more details, very disturbing things that people want to normalize. It's hard to even watch a movie now with kids. You can't watch a kid's movie. You have to screen it six ways to Sunday, right? There's all these hidden satanic messages and everything. You can't go to a library. You can't go to a, a, the kid's section in a library and the kids, mommy, can I read this? Oh, let me look. Let me look at it. Oh, no. What's wrong with it? It's a kid's book. No, no. So you have, to, you have to sort the books out. 
haram, halal, in the kids section. What's going on? Ajib and gharib, types of things going on. You know? So when we have this type of, you know, distress, remember these past blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That number one, he made you Muslim, he put you in a masjid on Laylatul Qadr. Who knows if you're going to be here next year? Even if you're alive, you may not be here. That Allah gave you tawfiq. Imam Malik said, and some of the teachers, they say, don't even say this, but he said that if you pray in jama'ah, isha, you have your portion for Laylatul Qadr. Just if you pray jama'ah, isha prayer. You've caught the Laylatul Qadr. You know? And part of the wisdom why the exact night wasn't given, because imagine a Muslim who knows the exact night and he's nowhere to be found in the masjid. How pitiful of state is that? If he knows the exact night, Ajib. Remem remember these past blessings. And then we have three imperatives for the future. So remember these past blessings, and here's something to do. As for the orphan, don't be harsh towards them. Why? Because you were an orphan. That's the subtext. Allah is saying, right? So there's a correspondence in these ayat. This is incredible in the Quran. The Quran, the surah, is a complete literary unit. The surahs are, chi uh, they have this uh, chiastic concord to them. There's this type of parallelism. That is, and this happens with short surahs and al-Baqarah. There's a book written by non-Muslim, UC Berkeley professor, Raymond Farron, called Coherence in the Quran, where he looks at surah al-Baqarah. He says the entire surah is a big chiasm. And if you're not writing this down, this is impossible. If he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is not looking at these ayahs and putting this here and this there, you can't do this. It's 286 verses. And not only that, he's receiving Baqarah and then a verse from Al-Ma'idah and Al-Nisa. He's not just getting all Baqarah and then, and then it's not in, the way he's receiving the Quran is not in the canonical order. It's in the chronological order. So he's telling the scribes where to put this ayah, where to put that ayah. And you look at these ayahs, you look at these surahs in the canonical order, and they're all works of art. This is impossible. Unless he has a 400 IQ, you can't do this. And this is what people are realizing now. Because the, the classical sort of orientalist, this Quran is jumbled up and it's, it's moving tenses and it's talking about Adam, then Moses, and then it's going back to Adam and it's, it's chronological. No, 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 no. If you have the depot of the Quran, you'll see the coherence of the ayat. And our scholars talked about this. This is not something non-Muslims found. Imam al-Razi talks about this. He calls it al-munasabat. You know, the sort of coherence of the ayat of the Quran. As for the orphan, do not over overwhelm him. And the one who asks you for something, the sa'il, don't reject him. What is this verse? What's the sort of parallel of this verse? You were searching for something, and he guided you. So the one who comes to you searching, right, don't reject them, because you were searching. In other words, treat these people like I treated you. Allah is telling the Prophet Sallallahu treat these people like I treated you. And as for the, uh, and as for the ni'mah, the blessing of your Lord, talk about it, speak of it. What is this ni'mah? Al-Islam, this religion. Speak about Islam, right? So this is our prescription. This is our, uh, this is our um, prescription for how to come out of the type of distress and, and depression, right? Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not forsaken you and does not hate you as long as you are in obedience to Allah and His Messenger. And we have tawbah, right? Toba is a very beautiful thing. We should be in one of two states, Toba or Shukr, or both. Toba or Shukr. And again, the modern world, they don't recognize these. Three of the greatest theological virtues. Toba, repentance. I'll finish in a minute here. Toba, right, repentance. The modern people in the modern world, the postmodern world, they don't believe in God. Many of them, they're atheists. Toba to who? You know? Why should I make Toba? I didn't do anything wrong. What's wrong with me? I'm perfect. And then shukur, gratitude. Gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Contrast that with the victim mentality that's being bred in these colleges, universities. Everyone's a victim, right? This is totally satanic because this is a satanic mentality, right? When Adam alayhi salam made tawbah, Rabbana thalamna anfusana, Adam and Eve. It's in the plural, right? Oh, our Lord, forgive us. Rabbana, we have wronged ourselves. Wa illam taghfir lana. And if you don't forgive us, we'll be from the lost ones, right? This is, this is Adam alayhi salam. This is the Adamic paradigm. What is the satanic paradigm? Because you did this to me, he says. You, you led me astray. Shaitan victimizes himself. The Prophet sallallahu did not victimize himself. He didn't. And there was real oppression happening. And th that's what happens when people victimize themselves and they're not real victims. What does it do? It completely minimizes people who are victims. And then we don't see that victimization. We don't see that oppression. The Prophet Sallallahu people threw garbage on him. He went home, he wrapped himself in his mantle, he laid down. Ya ayyuhal mudathir, qum fa'anthir, warabbaka fatahir, warabbaka fakabbir, qum fa'anthir. Oh, you wrapped in a mantle. Stand up. Qum means get up. Literally stand up and also have istiqama. You know? And, and dust yourself off. Clean your clothes. They threw this on you. Clean it. Don't expect someone to pick you up and start cleaning you. You have to do it yourself. And shun their idolatry, shun their, their, their defilements, uh, and magnify your Lord. Uh, and don't expect anything in return. Don't expect any reward from human beings. This is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> bless all of you, bless all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our fasting and our worship. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, blot out our sins. One of the greatest of the dua, the ad'iyah of the Prophet sallam, during the last 10 nights. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are the one. Al-afu al means the one who erases the sin. It's gone. Like Allah is called al-ghafir, al-ghaffar, al-ghafur, the, the one who forgives. Right? But the sin is still there. He just forgives it. But the afu is the one who, it's deleted. It's gone completely. And Allah can delete things completely. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to delete all of our sins so there's no trace of them. And he loves, the Prophet said, he loves to delete sins. So delete them from us. With your permission, Dr. Adita, a few questions? So put you on the spot. All right. If you want to raise your hands, usually the sisters have the most bravery than the brothers. So I'm looking at your side. I doubt it. <laughs> sisters? Nobody? Oh my God. You're letting me down. No question? Oh, good. All right. I'll come to you next, brother. MashaAllah, brothers. Um, so during the speech, like uh, at one moment, like what I heard when you mentioned Khatija, like her name, right? You uh, in, like what I heard is like instead of saying Raliyallawana, you said Alayhum uh, Salam. Uh, so I just want to know, like, what is the right way to uh, you know address the era? Yes. So. Sometimes when I do that, people think I'm a Shiite. <laughs> Say, where are you from? Iran? Oh. What is your name? Ali. <laughs> okay. No, we can, we can say, alayhi salam, alayhi salam for Sahaba. It's perfectly permissible to do that. You'll find um, handwritten makhtutat, handwritten manuscripts of Sahih al-Bukhari, where they write, Fatima alayhi salam, because she's from Ahl al-Bayt. Right? Uh, so it's permissible to say it. Um, for some reason, 
just sound kind of organically, I guess maybe to, I don't know, to maybe draw a distinction between Sunnis and Shia, that a culture kind of developed where the Sunnis would say radiallahu anhu and anha and the, and the Shia, they would say alayhi salam, alayhi salam. But when I meet you, I say salamu alaykum, right? I say alayhi salam to you. Alayk, salamu alayka. Um, so, um, so it's perfectly permissible to do that, you know. Um, and especially for Ahl al-Bayt, I mean, the Ahl al-Bayt have a, in Sunni orthodoxy, they have a special rank with us, right? Um, so, and this is something in the Quran. In Surah Shura, in Surah Shura, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, "Say, no reward do I ask of you for this, except love for the family." And this is interpreted by almost by many many Sunni Sunni mufassirin, the, that it is incumbent, it is it is obligatory to love the family of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that they have a special place, right? And you have the hadith, Indi tarikun fikum al-thaqalain kitabullah wa sunnati. That's one hadith, that's a sound hadith, but there's an even stronger hadith in our books, Sunni books. Kitabullah wa itrati ahlil bayti. And there's no contradiction here. See, so what is it then? Do we follow the sunnah or the ahlil bayt? Right? There's no contradiction because the sunnah has always been preserved uh, in its most pristine form amongst the ahlil bayt. And most ahlil bayt are ahlul sunnah wal jama'ah. Most descendants of the Prophet ﷺ are Sunni. People don't realize that. You know, uh, that's just a fact. You know, I was in a Shiite mosque one time, and the brother stood up and he said, he said, he said, uh, do you do you follow the imams or do you or do you go after the Khalifas? That's how he put it. <laughs> I said, well, what Khalifas are you talking about? He said, you know the Khalifas. I said, no, you name them. He said, okay. He said, Abu Bakr. I said, yeah, no, I follow Abu Bakr. He said, Umar, uh -huh. Uthman, keep going. Uh, <laughs> okay. So the question is faulty. The very question is false. Right? So, you know, we shouldn't fall victim to these kinds of, these kinds of simplistic polemics. Right? Um, but, you know, that's, that's part of our tradition, you know. We love Ahlul Bayt, and we're not afraid to say it, and we don't care what people think about us when we say that we love Ahlul Bayt. Okay, sisters. Okay, good. I'll come to you, brother. Sorry. Assalamu alaikum. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Um, my question is, if you have a consistent pattern of uh, where you're, you're having some kind of a problem or question and then you show up to a, a talk or a khutbah and that conversation is being referenced of what your troubles were or your questions were, is there a deeper meaning to that? I've always been curious. Thank you. Allahu alam, I, I don't know. Yeah, probably. I mean, we should keep our eyes open, you know, for things like that. Um, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, uh, is using the, the asbab, he's using certain means to give us the answer to things. This happens, I mean, it's people, you know, they say this is coincidence and things like that, but this happens a lot. I remember just, just tonight I was... <laughs> I was uh, I was uh, behind Qari Amar, and I was and you know my. It, they say that if you can if you can if you can keep your brain having one extraneous thought during the prayer, you've reached wilaya, right? And Abu Bakr did that during his prayer; he was completely focused. But most of us are not awliya, so during my prayer, I thought suddenly it came to me: what am I going to talk about later? And then Qari Amar recited an ayah, and I said, "Oh." MashaAllah, like right then, wow, perfect. So we can keep our eyes open. It's like the guy, you know, who, um, what is the, uh, the joke? He was, um, there was a flood or something, he's standing on his roof, right? And, they, and uh, you know, this, the, the, there's, it's, in, in the car, the, the ambulance comes by and says, get in, get in, it's going to be flooded. He's like, no, 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 I made dua to Allah. 
He's okay, and the ambulance goes away. And then it's, it's flooding, and a guy comes with a boat. He says, get in, get in. You're, you're going to be you're drowned. I made dua to Allah. And then the, the water gets higher and higher, and he's like, he's about to drown. And a helicopter comes, throws him a, a rope. He said, grab the rope, you're going to drown. I made dua to Allah. And then he dies. And then on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he says to Allah, I made dua to you. He said, yeah, and Allah says, I, I sent you a car. I sent you, a, I sent you a, uh, a, a rowboat. I sent you a helicopter. This was the answer to your dua. Three times. <laughs> okay, I'm coming, brother. Let's have him go first. Yeah, I'll come. Thank you. Uh, so when you were speaking about the uh, Khawadij, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Yeah. They were really strong in Ibadah, even more than the companions, uh, and they had this practice that where they would count the, they would say some, like the dhikr, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, and they would count it on stones, and they would kind of put them in front of them, right? Would you say that's equivalent to the prayer beads? Is there any relation? Um, I was wondering if... That's okay. Get my steps in. Um, I, I haven't heard that about the stones. Um, but according to the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah, uh, it is a practice of the Salaf uh, to use the Subha. And that it's, it's a good thing to use the Subha. Even just to have it on you, even if you don't use it. Because when you feel it on your person, even if you don't use it, you'll, you tend to make dhikr, or you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I, I doubt seriously that it has origins with the khawarij. Um, but Allahu alam, I haven't heard that before. But you're right about the khawarij. I mean, when Sayyidina Ali sent Ibn Abbas to them, he said that during the, uh, after Dhuhr, when it's very, really hot, and the Sahaba are taking their naps, you can hear buzzing like bees in the dwellings of the, uh, of the Khawarij because they're reciting the Quran, right? He says, if you saw them pray, you would, you would nullify your prayer. You think your prayer is nothing. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the prayer, the Qira'ah, doesn't pass their throats. It doesn't, in other words, it doesn't penetrate the heart. You know, so that's the danger of being a formalist, right? And... Isa alayhi salam, I mean, Imam al-Ghazali quotes a lot from Isa alayhi salam because during his time, Imam al-Ghazali was dealing with a kind of Pharisaic mentality where there was all this sort of um, importance attached to the outward and not ne necessarily on the inward. The outward is important, there's no doubt about it. But if the outward is sound and the inward is corrupt, you know, then that's, that's a problem. You know, Imam Ghazali he mentions a story in the uh, Marvels of the Heart. He says there was a there was a sheikh a sheikh of Sharia of fiqh. He was a faqih, and then there was a Sufi. And when I say Sufi, I mean I'm talking about a man of ihsan. I'm not talking about some sect of Islam or something or um, some New Age type of you know. The Sufi, according to our traditional understanding, is someone who doesn't have any dunya in their heart. So by, by this definition, the Sahaba were Sufis. By this definition. So Sufi or Tasawwuf is a technical term for Ihsan. And Ihsan is the third component, the third major component mentioned by the Prophet Wasallam in the Hadith Jibreel. Anyway, so this is not an absolute dichotomy. It's not like there's fiqh on one hand and there's, this is just an example he's given, he's, he's given in the Aja'ib al Qulub, the marvels of the heart, Aja'ib al Qalb, to demonstrate the importance of inward sciences. So he says there was a faqih, his name was Shaykh Ibrahim al Raqi, and he heard about some mystic uh, named Abu Khair. So he went to the dwellings of this mystic, and he, he noticed that he was praying Maghrib, so he caught the prayer behind him, and then during the prayer, uh, Shaykh Ibrahim was thinking, this guy's qara'a is, is horrible. His voice is horrible. Yeah, what is this? He wasn't making any mistakes, but just his voice was, you know. So then after the prayer, uh, they had a conversation, 
and uh, he said that uh, he may, meant go, went to go make uh, refresh his wudu, Sheikh Ibrahim, and he went and he was over by the wudu area and he said, he said a lion came out of nowhere, a lion, right? <laughs> Sheikh like, ah! And he ran back. He said, he said to the, he said to Abu Khair, he said, there's a lion in your wudu area. And, and the mystic said, ah, he's still there? So he went over there and he grabbed the lion by his mane. He said, don't you know I have a guest? Get out of here. And then the sheikh said, oh, how did you do this? And so Abu Khair said to him, you put so much stock on the outward, you're afraid of lions. I put more stock on the inward and lions fear me. <laughs> so ultimately the state of the heart is the most, this is what the Khawarij missed. The Khawarij, the Khawarij they were, there's a story mentioned by Ibn Asakir where he says that three of the Khawarij, they massacred a, a, a family, a companion of the Prophet They killed him, they killed his pregnant wife and, and they, they took out the fetus and slit its throat. These are Khawarij. They did this to a companion of the Prophet because they said to him, what is your opinion of Ali? And they said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, and they said, kill him. Right? And so, and, and then Ibn Asakari mentions they were walking along and they saw this kind of orchard area and they started picking grapes and eating them. And they suddenly said to, to, to themselves, we didn't ask the owner for permission, astaghfirullah, we're eating grapes, we're stealing grapes. And he says, look at this mentality. They have, they have the blood of a massacred family from the Sahaba on their clothes and they're worried about some grapes. Yeah, the grape, you're, okay, it's, you stole some grapes. But look at the bigger picture here. This didn't occur to them. Anyway. You want to stop? No, go ahead. Okay. All right. Sisters, before I go to the brothers. Yes. I'll start. I'll be right back, brother. No, you're good. You're good. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so, in the lecture, you said that uh, Allah has uh, sworn by uh, life of uh, Prophet Muhammad. So, uh, I just want to know in uh, Quran, uh, what are uh, the other things that uh, Allah has sworn by, uh, and what is their significance? So, there's <clears throat> different uh, adjurations. So, while Asr, right? Asr time, Allah takes an oath. So, you'd have to actually go into the tafasir to look at the significance of these things. Wa layli ida yaksha. Right? Um, what are some other ones? Wa al fajri wa layalin ashura shafi'il wa al-watr. Right? Wa tini wa zaytun. Right? So, we'd have to go into the tafasir. Right? But there's, there's great significance attached to these objects. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can swear by whatever he wants. But we swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We only swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah swears by the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. About qawm alut. I swear by your life. They are just, they are intoxicated in their lust. Very interesting. Ah, yeah. And unfortunately, nowadays you have people that, like I said, there's this kind of leveling across the board. People think they can interpret the Quran without requisite knowledge. You know, an alim, an alim is someone who has at least 25 years of full, full time training. 25 years, full time studies. That's an alim. A sheikh, 40 years. Right? So anyone under 40 who claims to be an alim. I'm very suspect of that. I mean, it's possible. They start studying at like 15 or something, but full-time for 25 years, you know. But you go to like these, you know, you take a class on intro to Quran at the university. They, have, they, they, uh, they read these texts through, through something called radical hermeneutics, which means that you can basically interpret the text however you want through any type of lens. So you have, for example, you know, a, um, I don't know, a feminist reading of Surat Maryam, uh, an LGBTQ plus reading of Surah Hud or something like that, where they're arguing something that's clearly antithetical to the text. But then you point out, what about this verse over here? They say, oh, don't worry about this verse. This is what every heterodox, every firqa, every, uh, every shuhba, every, um, uh, every heretical group in Islamic history, they use the Quran to justify their positions. But they don't, they don't look at the entire Quran. 
Ibn Hisham says the Quran is a jumla wahida. It's like one sentence. And you can't just isolate something from that sentence. Right? Afatu'minuna bi ba'dil kitabi wa takfuruna bi ba'd. This is what Ahlil Kitab did. Allah addresses the Ahlil Kitab in the Quran. Do you believe in some of the book but not other parts of the book? And they're very brazen about this. A very famous, I mentioned this before, a very famous feminist Muslim professor who says, you know, if there's a, if there's a verse in the Quran that you are offended by it, just say no. Just say no to Allah. This is how she puts it. Just say no. No, Allah. Just say no. When I was a kid in elementary school, our teachers used to tell us, someone offers you drugs. Just say no. That's good advice. Just say no to Allah. Bad advice. But I don't know, you know, I, I feel sorry for our young people entering into these institutions. I really do. I mean, it's just, I don't know how they, it's a jungle out there. And, you know, if they can hold on to their iman, you know, that's a, it's a, uh, it's a tough, it's a tough place, Annie. And it's getting harder. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our iman, you know, to give us, to give us istiqama, to give us ithbat in the religion. You know, not to be afraid. You look at these other religions, they're just, they're, they fear human beings. You know, they fear human beings. They don't fear Allah. The Quran says, Injili bima anzalallahu fi. Let the people of the gospel take, take by the gospel, let, let the people of the gospel take a hukum by what Allah has revealed therein. The Quran wants the Christians to follow their text. Follow your text, because that'll make for a better world. This is why Muslim men can make Christian women. You say, but they're Trinitarian. Yeah, but they have family values that are similar to ours, that'll make for a good marriage. They believe in gender roles. They believe in traditional morality. Those things count in a marriage. They count very high. It's very important. Follow your book. But nowadays you have people, you know, they basically, interpret their text through the current lens, the, the current zeitgeist, which means the spirit of this age. Whatever is, again, whatever is latest is greatest. It must be the greatest, because I'm, I'm living now. It must be the greatest. I'm alive, right? <laughs> I know we can keep going all night with questions, but we'll take one last question. Dr. Latay. Yeah, JazakAllah. So, um, in your experience, like with Christian debaters, because that's how I kind of like knew you, have you perceived like any shifts in like the intellectual rigor um, over time? And uh, what is the most prominent topic of discussion with them currently? Because I'm noticing that they're a little bit weak. They're very, they've, they're kind of repeating the same, regurgitating the same discussions. Um, also, uh, I want to invite you client, kindly to Clubhouse sometime. <laughs> to uh, speak to some of the brothers there that try to give dawah. I mean, we speak to Christians there all the time, but yeah, just that. But yeah, I mean, what is what is kind of like the hot topics now with apologists? Because, you know, Sam Shamoon, a bunch of these apologists are just really weak. Like they really have nothing going for them. So is it fun anymore? Like kind of describe like what's going on in that field, if you don't mind, please. Yeah, I really wish you didn't mention this person's name, yeah. you know. These people are mustahzi'un, right? And, and it's, it's impermissible for us to even sit with them, you know. A mustahzi is someone who mocks and ridicules the religion, who mocks and ridicules the Prophet Sallallahu We're not even supposed to give them a platform. Don't even, just completely ignore them. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Wa kafa na, what does he say? Wa kafa, but the mustahzi'in, Allah says, I will suffice you with respect to the mustahzi'in. In other words, I'll take care of them. Like Abu Jahal and Abu Lahab, right? Um, 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 there's a few, seven or eight of them that were known. All of them, all of them were killed at Badr or they died from disease. You know, so I, I wouldn't engage, I would be very discriminatory as to who you engage with. Even if they're claiming to be Christian and they come to you with smiles and this and that, and you know, I, I learned my lessons the hard way. I mean, there was a Coptic Christian guy who was smiling and talking about love, this and that, and 
he wanted to have a debate with me in 2003. And I said, yeah, we met the night before at a hotel and we were, he was very cordial and this and that. And, and then the next day at the event, he had three other debaters. So it's like a four against one. And two of these guys were like fluent in Arabic and they knew like Quran and Hadith and everything. I mean, still one. I mean, come on. <laughs> we took care of business, you know. And I remember the MSA was panicking. And they're calling. We're trying to get this local imam to come help you. I said, relax, brother. <laughs> the haq will win. <laughs> and then uh, it was just, uh, but it got to a point because they were losing. It got to a point where this man, who's who's a he's a Coptic, um, he's a Coptic priest. He became belligerent and started slandering the Prophet And at that point, we we can't, you know, you know, lesson learned, right? But you're right. It's the same issues. You know, they're bringing up you know, marriages of the Prophet Sallam and. They bring up uh, the fact that the Prophet was uh, a military leader, and all of this is hypocrisy. I mean, um, I mean, if you look at the, if you look at all of the casualties in every battle of the Prophet uh, Abu Hassan al Nadwi, rahimahullah, he did. He actually did a study on this, and he said there's about 1,018 casualties in all of the Ghazawat of the Prophet Enemy and Muslim, Mushrikeen and Muslims, 100, 1,018 men in 23 years. All men on the battlefield, right? Musa alayhi salam, in Exodus 34, he comes down the mountain, he sees his own people worshiping the golden calf, he orders 3,000 men slaughtered on the spot in one night. But he's a prophet. But the prophet, I'm, oh no, he can't be a prophet. Okay? This is total hypocrisy. Um... And then, you know, they bring up things like preservation of the Qur'an and things like that. What they're doing is they're banking on Muslim ignorance of their own text. They know a lot of Muslims. They've never heard of Qira'at. They've never heard of the Ahruf al -Sab a So they'll bring like a Qur'an. It says, Maliki Yawm al Mal with a dagger alif. And another Qur'an says, Maliki Yawm al Malik, Malik. Oh, two different Qur'ans. And then the Muslim the Du'at that are very young, right? They're there and they're doing their best. They start going, they, they have this cognitive dissonance. And you, you wrote this Quran. You, this is a fabrication. You're calling this a fabrication? Yeah, oh, really? You know. Um, so, a lot of it's sort of, you know, smoke and mirrors. It's the same stuff regurgitated. I don't find any strong arguments coming from the Christian side. Um, you know, uh, but, you know, we, we have to be cordial with people. The, these kind of debates that are highly polemical, I mean, I, I debated this other guy, I'm not going to mention his name, very popular on YouTube, and this was about 16 years ago, you know, um, and it's a, it was a bad idea, uh, but, um, you know, we should have adab with people, we should be discriminatory with people as to who we uh, debate, um, and at the end of the day, lakum dina kum aliyadeen, right? So we should inform, we should inform with adab. The Quran tells us how to make da'wah, right? So call people to the way of your Lord with hikmah, which means dala'il, according to Imam Zamakhshari and others. He says it means with proofs, scriptural proofs, rational proofs, historical proofs. hasana means good uh, attitude, good comportment, right? With adab, right? So both of these have to have to work inshallah um, but you know we shouldn't we shouldn't disrespect people's religions uh, we shouldn't um, you know mock people this is not the sunnah you know we're, we're all guilty of this doing things like this in the past uh, so we make tawbah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us because we're be hindering people from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we don't want that to happen Allah says don't curse their gods or else they're gonna curse Allah right so we could point things out to them you know, with adab, it's very difficult to do. I don't have the temperament for debate anymore. This is what I've learned. I don't have the temperament because I let my ego get involved and I, I can't do it. I, 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 would, I thought that when I got older, I would be more patient, but I've just become a crotchety old man. <laughs> I don't want to hear these bad arguments anymore. Uh, you can miss me with all of that now. I don't want to hear it anymore. I've already, dealt, I've already dealt with it. That doesn't mean I won't come on Clubhouse. I mean, I'll come on. <laughs> I'll come on Shalobun. Thank you.
ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم صلى الله سيد محمد ولا آله وصحبه معين نسألك لا إله إلا الله نسألك لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد ولا إله إلا الله نشهد ولا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد ولا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة